Great. Thank you, Sergey, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for everybody that came in person. And thank you for everybody that came online. Um, today, I'll be talking about my research that I've been working on over the past five years. And it's uh, based on complex mixtures of terpenes and how they result in the highly viscous secondary organic aerosol. Volatile organic compounds are organic gases released into the atmosphere. And they can come from various sources, such as industry, as well as biogenic sources, such as plants and vegetation. And it's been estimated that upwards of 100,000 different VOCs have been emitted into the atmosphere. And of this total amount of VOCs, 90% of them come from biogenic sources, such as plants and vegetation. Additionally, about 1,700 different VOCs have been identified across 90 different tree species. And depending on the tree species, the specific volatile organic profile released from the tree can vary. And so here I'm showing a, a geospatial distribution of forests around the world. And you can see that in the Northern Hemisphere, this is dominated by boreal forest trees. And therefore, a lot of studies that have investigated VOC emission profile from trees have focused on boreal forest type trees. However, um, again, VOC emission profile can change with tree type and you can see in the southern hemisphere of the main forest type is tropical forest. So volatile organic compounds released from pine trees specifically are, um, are terpenes. And this is a class of compounds um, defined by their isoprene unit, which is a C5H8 hydrocarbon. And these terpenes are produced during plant metabolism and make up the essential oils of plants. And they can be released um, during uh, photosynthesis. So um, the most abundant terpene in the atmosphere um, is a monoterpene, a C10H16 compound with two isoprene units. And so here are a couple of the most abundant um, monoterpenes, alpha-pinene, limonene, and then myrcene is an acyclic um, that is also abundant. Um, sesquiterpenes can also contribute to uh, the terpene profile in the atmosphere. And here are a couple of um, abundant sesquiterpenes, such as beta-caryophylline, the most abundant. Now, um, all, all of these different isomeric species of terpenes can have different reactivities in the atmosphere with respect to oxidants. And uh, depending on their structure and placement of double bonds, they can react differently with oxidants such as hydroxyl radical, nitrate radical, and ozone. And when they react with these oxidants, they form um, low volatility species such as semi-volatile species that can condense and partition into the um, particle phase. And we call these particles secondary organic aerosol because they're formed secondarily in the atmosphere. And depending on what VOCs and mixtures they're formed from, they can have drastically different physical properties. So for instance, they can range in phase states. So they can take on liquid-like phases and um, semi-solid phases all the way to glassy phases. Additionally, these um, SOA compounds or SOA particles have thousands of different compounds inside them, and the individual compounds can range in volatility. So understanding how these different um, terpenes and their mixtures influence physical properties is very important. Healthy plants are those considered growing under ideal growing conditions, such as enough sunlight, enough uh, soil and nutrient, um, uh, soil and nutrients, and enough water. And Healthy plants emit a very specific bouquet of volatile organic compounds specific to each plant. And once these compounds um, react in the atmosphere through oxidation, they form secondary organic aerosol, which if they can uptake enough water can actually nucleate clouds. So we call this cloud condensation nuclei. And depending on um, how they form the clouds, they can impact climate through indirect or direct effects. But plants experience a wide variety of environmental conditions. Um, so they can experience abiotic stressors such as temperature extremes, drought, differences in soil nutrients, and also exposure to UV and ozone stress. Um, besides abiotic stressors, there are a ton of biotic stresses that plants experience, such as um, feeding on by insects, different viruses and microorganisms, as well as different animals and competitive species impacting these plants. And so for the duration of my talk, I'm going to be talking mainly about biotic stress induced by insects. For example, um, aphids, which uh, suck the sap out of pine, um, pine trees, um, they induce a biochemical defense mechanism in plants. 
similar to a human getting stung by a bee or having some sort of insect bite. They have an immune response and they produce a chemically and um, uh, chemically different VOCs than they would under healthy conditions. Um, and they also change their emission rates as well. And so when this happens, the SOA that can form from this terpene profile changes. And the SOA can have physically different properties such as hygroscopicity, which dictates how much water the aerosol can uptake. And therefore it can influence their cloud condensation nuclei properties and impacts climate differently under periods of stress compared to healthy plants. So um, these plants are very smart. They emit uh, VOCs for a ton of different reasons. One of them is for stress relief and recovery. Some of these volatile organic compounds or terpenes actually aid in plant um, antioxidation um, relief. Uh, so in periods of exposure to ozone, they can actually produce some antioxidants that help with their survival rates. Additionally, they can actually talk to each other by releasing these volatile organic compounds. We call this plant signaling. And so they can actually forewarn another plant if they're experiencing stress so that the other plant can become primed and increase survival rates. They can also aid in the direct uh, defense against herbivores, so they can deter herbivores from coming. And they can also attract herbivores to remove, or attract predators to remove the herbivores that are feeding on them. So um, they serve a very specific ecological function. So one parameter that I'm gonna be talking about today is viscosity. And I'm gonna be talking mainly about dynamic viscosity measured in Pascal seconds. And so this is referring to a fluid's um, resistance to gradual deformation by shear or tensile stress. And there was a study in 2013 by Riemann, Wolf et al, in which they investigated a single monoterpene, alpha pinene, which is very abundant in the atmosphere. And they gener generated SOA under ozonal conditions. And what they were looking at was the relative humidity dependence on viscosity. And so what they found was that at low relative humidity, um, low relative humidity, they saw that the SOA had a semi-solid type phase. And so here the graph is broken down into liquid regime, which is below 10 to the two Pascal seconds. Semi-solid is between 10 to the two and 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds. And above um, 10 to the 12 Pascal seconds, we consider this a glass of solid. And so what they saw is that after they increased relative humidity um, to around 50 or 60%, the viscosity dropped and it was more like um, that of peanut butter than it was of tar pitch, which is a very viscous petroleum substance. And so as they increased further, uh, the viscosity dropped even further and it was more like honey. And so this is because um, water acts as a plasticizer and allows for more um, dyna dynamic movement within the particle um, as the particle uptakes water. And so viscosity is important because it can impact gas to particle partitioning time in which um, semi-volatiles partitioning in and out of the particle will become uh, slowed down at high viscosity, um, or if the particle is solid or semi-solid. Additionally, ice nucleation can be impacted where under um, low viscous SOA, the only um, pathway for formation of ice nucleation is homogeneous nucleation, in which the particle has to become supercooled in, in order to freeze. However, under high viscosity, um, situations, you open up a different pathway where you can actually heterogeneously nucleate through some sort of external seed. And this can happen at warmer temperatures than it would for low viscous SOA. Additionally, um, heterogeneous chemistry can be impacted in which the diffusion of oxidants into the SOA can become slowed at um, high viscosity. And so each of these atmospheric processes are important because they can impact um, climate, um, air quality, and visibility. And one thing that was really um, crucial about this study was that it was a very pioneering study. And since this one, um, there's been a ton of other studies and it's become a very hot topic to investigate um, viscosity, both relative humidity dependence and also temperature dependence is a new, um, a new thing to study. And so, um, however, most of these studies have only focused on single precursor systems. But there is a push to investigate blends because there is a, wide variety of VOCs in the atmosphere and SOA in an ambient environment will likely form from multiple different VOCs. And so this was a study by um, Champion et al. in 2019 in which they generated SOA from terpene mixtures 
and also compared them to single terpenes, um, beta caryophylline and sesquiterpene, terpenaline, um, limonene, which are both monoterpenoids. And they uh, generated this using an oxidation flow reactor. And what they saw was that um, as on the x-axis, they're showing the fraction of the particles in extremely low volatility organic compounds and um, low volatility organic compounds. And they saw that as you increase your um, low volatility species, you end up having a higher viscosity. And additionally, they saw that beta caryophylline, even by itself, had the highest uh, viscosity in each of the systems studied. They also um, compared blends of these different ones. And you can see that for the blends here, the viscosities aren't additive. So simply taking beta caryophylline and um, something like limonene and trying to do a backhand of the calculation to figure out viscosity does not work. So we need to really investigate um, more mixtures in order to accurately determine their viscosity. Another parameter that's very important is liquid-liquid phase separation. And so here's a diagram depicting liquid-liquid phase separation or SOA. And in this, you have a outer organic rich phase um, with an inner aqueous rich phase. And so there was a study that I was a part of in which we investigated diesel fuel vapor SOA. And this is a good proxy for anthropogenic SOA um, generated from mixtures in the atmosphere. And for phase separation experiments, um, here we do this in an optical microscope. So we condition at a certain relative humidity, then we sequentially decrease the humidity and see where there's a disappearance of the two phases. So what you're seeing here is three different um, diesel SOA particles. And um, the grayscale images are the actual optical microscope images. And the green and the blue are just illustrations to help guide your eye of what's going on inside. And so we start at high relative humidity, we decrease it, and we saw that for diesel fuel uh, vapor SOA, there was a persistence of liquid-liquid phase separation down to lower humidities around 70%. Now this was very critical because before this, um, things like alpha pinene, a single monoterpene, had only experienced phase separation down to 90%. So this was the first time that we saw an extension of this to more um, ambient um, humidities. So uh, this indicated that phase separation could actually be more important than we previously thought. Um, also, it was uh, thought that this could only occur for um, particles that had inorganic seeds because inorganic um, seed particles uptake a lot of water. And so this was uh, free of any inorganic seeds of purely organic system. And so phase separation is important because it can govern the total mass of SOA. It can impact the light scattering and absorption properties of aerosol, the chemical reactivity and their cloud processing. So understanding phase separation will help us better understand each of these different um, processes. So for my dissertation, I have uh, three different goals. So the first one is how does the relative humidity dependent viscosity change between a single sesquiterpene versus a single monoterpene? In the second, or I guess third chapter of my actual dissertation, but my second goal of this talk is to investigate how complex mixtures of VOCs lead to a change in viscosity versus a single precursor like alpha pinene, and if there's a difference between healthy and stressed SOA. Additionally, we'd like to confirm our um, question from um, chapter three by comparing to real pine tree SOA to see if this can actually be represented by simpler mixture systems. And so the first goal I addressed in my dissertation, um, we investigated the humidity-dependent viscosity of secondary organic aerosol from the ozonolysis of beta caryophylline. And we also compared this to alpha pinene. However, um, due to the sake of time, I'm not going to be talking about this in, in today's uh, talk. So for my first question, I answered this by investigating viscosity and liquid-liquid phase separation of mimic, healthy, and stressed pine tree SOA. And so, um, like I said previously, um, the Northern Hemisphere is de dominated by boreal forest type trees. And a boreal forest uh, tree that's very common is Scott's pine tree. So uh, Professor Celia Viola um, published this paper in 2018 in which she investigated SOA mass yields as a function of condensed aerosol mass. And what she found was that beta caryophylline, a single sesquiterpene, had the highest yield followed by Scott's pine SOA in orange and then alpha pine SOA in um, the blue diamond. And so what this indicated was that both beta caryophylline and alpha pinene SOA are contributing to the SOA mass yield. 
And so using the same um, stock pine trees um, from this plot, panel A, she uh, plotted it as a function of sequitropine to monotropine ratio um, initially uh, before the aerosol was generated. And so what we find is that increased uh, sequitropine to monotropine ratio is associated with higher SOA yields um, in comparison to alpha So this is sort of like the first uh, step in indicating that more complex mixtures representative of real trees cannot be accurately represented by a single monotropine. And so we were interested to see how that extrapolates to other physical properties. So um, there's another study by Professor Celia Viola in which she investigated the VOC emission profile of healthy and stressed uh, stock pine trees. And these were uh, stressed by aphids. And so here is showing the um, monotropine um, profile as well as the sesquitropine profile. And both the healthy and aphid stressed uh, cases were dominated by alpha pining and monotropines. However, there was an increase in sesquitropines, mainly farnazine, for the aphid stress scenario. And uh, farnazine is a well-characterized uh, plant stress hormone um, induced by aphid infestation. And so for my investigation, I took this paper and modeled um, it in order to make two different commercially available uh, mixtures. One to rep represent healthy plant SOA um, in green and stress plant SOA in black. Again, most of these um, mixtures were dominated by monotropines, but there is an increased fraction of sesquitropines in the stress plant mimic. And so I took um, my mixtures and evaporated them into our five cubic meter smog chamber operated in batch mode here at UC Irvine. And after evaporation, we initiated photo oxidation by injecting peroxide and turning on our UV lights, which generated our OH radical. And after about two hours, we had a peak um, particle mass concentration determined by a scanning mobility particle sizer. And after that peaked, then I collected onto a particle sampler, which is called Moody or Micro Orifice Uniform Deposit Impactor. And I operated this um, without all the other stages. So this was just stage eight and it was operated non-rotating mode. And so um, here what you're seeing is five different um, hydrophobically coated glass slides. And the reason that we needed to have them hydrophobic because we wanted discrete spots of SOA. And if there's a range of viscosity, um, under low viscosity scenarios, you can have them sort of smearing out. So we wanted um, really nice discrete spots. Um, just as a reference, our particle size in the chamber was sort of centered around 90 nanometers. But after collection for about three hours, they aggregated on top of each other and coalesced to a particle that was about 30 to 50 microns. And so um, I took these particles and then did a suite of offline analysis analysis techniques, including liquid-liquid phase separation, viscosity, and um, high-resolution mass spectrometry using nanodesorption electrospray ionization. And so here are the results from our high-resolution mass spectrometry data, in which we see our stressed plant SOA in black and our healthy plant SOA in green. And what we saw was that there was a shift in both negative mode, represented in the top panel, and positive mode, represented in the bottom panel, to higher molecular weight for our stress plant scenario. And um, above 250 um, uh, neutral mass was um, indicated a higher fraction in the stress plant SOA. And so here I'm just highlighting um, five of the most abundant peaks that were also present in positive mode, but I'm just labeling them in negative mode. And um, we tentatively identified structures based off of uh, previous reports in the literature. And the um, top four, so, um, Compounds one through four were associated with monotropine oxidation products, whereas um, compound number five was associated with um, a sesquitropine product for beta curiophylline. But these are tentative structures, so they could have come from other sesquitropines or monotropines. Um, and we, we think that this higher um, molecular weight um, area is associated with sesquitropine oxidation products. So in order to investigate liquid-liquid phase separation, um, this was done at um, University, University of British Columbia along with the Pope flow setup. And so this is very similar where we take our particle um, and we put it into a, uh, a flow cell and we can change the relative humidity by flowing um, nitrogen through a bubbler system and controlling it with mass flow controllers. And so um, here is what uh, it looks like for a healthy plant SOA. Uh, abbreviated HD. And so uh, we start at high relative humidity around 98%. 
So there should be a lot of water um, partitioning against the aerosol. And then we sequentially decrease to lower relative humidity. And what you're looking for is the humidity at which you see a disappearance of two phases and only end up with one homogeneous organic phase. And so for healthy plant SOA, we saw that this only occurred to around 90%. Um, and SRH is the separation relative humidity. And so um, this was comparable to previous studies done for alpha pinene, in which they saw a phase separation only persisting from 100 to around 90%. However, when we included our uh, stress plant SOA system, there is an extension all the way down to around 20% relative humidity. And so this is very critical because alpha pinene does not represent the phase separation for this. And additionally, our, um, our previous study using diesel only had phase separation around to 70%. So this was the first time that we saw a phase separation for a purely organic system this low. So in terms of our aerosol um, viscosity, we did these measurements again at University of British Columbia using the Pope flow method. And so here is an illustration of our substrate that had our nice discrete spots. And you're actually looking um, at an optical microscope that's underneath the slide. So you're looking through the glass slide and you humidify to uh, whatever relative humidity you want. Um, the conditioning chimes will vary depending on if you have high or low relative humidity. And what we do is we end up poking the particle. And when you remove the particle or remove the needle, it ends up with a deformation in the particle. And over time, the particle will flow in order to minimize the surface energy. And so um, the time that it takes to fill back in, um, for our case, it was to um, one quarter of the original area of the hole. This is called the relaxation time. And we can use this relaxation time of the particle reforming and plug it into um, COMSOL multiphysics, a um, microfluidic, um, comps, or microfluidic um, model that can give us parameters for upper and lower bounds for viscosity. So there's some other assumptions that you have to include as well, like contact angle, slip, slip length, and, and things like that. So here's an actual video of a poke flow experiment for a stress plant SOA at 0% relative humidity. And this shiny thing coming in, that's our needle, but we can't see it because we're looking up underneath. So after the needle pokes the particle and you remove it, it actually shatters. And after um, six hours, the particle actually never reforms. And so here I'm showing healthy plant SOA in green, stress plant SOA in black, and alpha piney photooxidation SOA as a reference in red. And so again, at a low relative humidity, we saw the particle was very viscous. Um, even more viscous than tar pitch. At 25% relative humidity, the particle um, flowed and reformed in the time span of 24 hours. And then at 50%, the particle reformed on the um, time scale of one hour. And so what we saw here was that at higher relative humidity, you can really see there's a separation between our different systems. Our alpha pinene consistently had the lowest viscosity, followed by our healthy plant SOA, which is monotropin and dominated. And then our stress plant SOA, which was still monotropine dominated, but had an increased fraction of about 20% sesquitropines. So this tiny amount of sesquitropines really impacted the um, SOA properties. And so to make um, viscosity more impactful for modelers, we can calculate diffusion coefficients using a Stokes-Einstein equation. And if we use that in tandem with assuming a particle diameter, we can actually calculate mixing times of organics within aerosol. And so here we're showing mixing times of organics um, with respect to a 200 nanometer um, aerosol particle. And this is because this represents the medium um, distribution in the volume distribution of aerosol in the atmosphere. Just for reference, accumulation mode is between 100 to about 1,000 nanometer particles. And so here we saw that mixing times for particles of both of our mimic systems is greater than one hour for humidities less than 40%. And this is very critical because climate models typically assume that um, organics or semi-volatiles become well-mixed within the time scale of about an hour. But we see that this is not true for both of our two systems that are more representative of what we find in the atmosphere. So the implications of this is that if you assume that the particles are instantaneously mixed, um, uh, especially for viscous aerosol, when they're not, and we see that they're not in this case, then the growth mechanism will shift between equilibrium partitioning to kinetic uptake, which is more efficient. You um, would likely 
uh, for higher X-ray mass. So we compared our two mixture systems to a previous system, polyamine X-ray, which up until this point was the most viscous single component um, organic system previously studied. And we see that for our healthy and our stressed in X-ray, it had a higher viscosity than polyamine. It is not expected because it's um, an, an anthropogenic source and it was very viscous. So healthy and stressed plants are more viscous than polyamine at RH less than 50%. So now our two systems are the most viscous. So in conclusion for this talk, um, we found that alpha piney photooxidation SOA, which represents a majority of terpenes in the atmosphere and also made up 80% of our um, two mixtures, um, had the lowest viscosity, followed by our healthy plant SOA, which was a mixture of monoterpenes, and then our stress SOA had the highest, which had 20% more sesquiterpenes. So we found that the addition of sesquiterpenes to VOC mixtures produces highly viscous SOA compared to monoterpene mixtures alone, and that a single component precursor could not accurately um, represent more complex systems. So for my next um, talk, I'm gonna see how these mixtures that we generated in the lab compared to a real system. And so to do this, I investigated the viscosity of real healthy and stressed Canary Island um, pine tree SOA. And this is an actual picture of one of my trees in lab. So um, volatile organic uh, profiles between um, individual pine species can vary. So it's important to expand SOA studies to other types of prominent pine trees. Um, for example, Pinus canariensis is a subtropical conifer native to uh, the Western Canary Islands. And although it's not um, native to other areas like North America or South America, it is frequently used in landscaping throughout California due to their drought and thermotolerant tolerant properties. Um, and just as a reference, the Canary Islands are off the coast of um, Africa and they are in a Mediterranean type climate similar to that of California. So that's sort of why we're, they're used here. And um, just to demonstrate how they are used in California, you can actually find them all around campus. And um, the tree uh, provider for our experiments were actually the same tree provider that plants trees across campus. And so um, they're rising in popularity and the use of this tree type uh, for the purpose of landscaping is increasing. So it'll be important to see how this changes. So um, to investigate real healthy and stressed SOA generation, we used the same chamber as before, but I needed to generate a uh, plant enclosure. So we grew these three-year-old um, uh, Canary Island pines here at UC Irvine, and they were living in the um, UCI greenhouse, which is a few buildings away. So I have to haul the trees here, and then in order to capture their VOC, I needed to generate a, um, a plant enclosure. So this is a two cubic meter um, Teflon enclosure with the help of Barrow. We made many bags together. <laughs> um, and so in order to um, prevent the plant from shutting off photosynthesis, we needed to supply it with humidified air it was not scrubbed of CO2. And um, at the side, I had a port of Teflon tubing connected to a Teflon pump. So we were actually actively pulling um, VOCs from the bag and putting it into our um, chamber. And also it doesn't show it in the picture, but the bag is zip tied around the base of the tree trunk. And this is to exclude any air soil interaction. So we're just sampling from what's coming off of the branches. And so um, this would take uh, a long time. Um, the plants would vary in emissions day to day from tree to tree. It was, it was a very challenging experiment and um, we would pump into the chamber between like 18 hours and 24 hours, but some days it would surprise me it only take seven. <laughs> so um, in order to figure out when to stop pumping into the chamber, we were monitoring um, total monoterpene and sesquiterpene um, in the chamber with a proton transfer reaction kind of like my spec. And then after we had all of our VOCs in the chamber, we collected cartridges for offline analysis of thermal desorption, gas chromatography, and mass spectrometry. And this would give us um, what individual isomers of terpenes we had. And so after that, we initiated photooxidation, um, let that happen for about two hours, and then collected after, or after uh, three hours. And then we also monitored a particle um, composition in real time um, using aerosol mass and we had two different systems. We'll talk about it on the next slide, but we did identify aphids. So we had a healthy and a stressed set. 
And this is what it looks like in lab. So um, I actually had to remove a ceiling tile because these trees were about eight feet tall. So it was a challenge to get them into lab. And it took up a lot of space. So thank you to my lab mates for putting up with me. <laughs> um, so here's the volatile profile for healthy and stressed pine undetermined from our thermal desorption GC mass data. And here I'm showing our healthy set in, um, in gray and our stress set in pink. And so the sample size was about three healthy plants and two, health, or two stressed plants. And so again, we see that alpha pinene dominated about 80% of the profile. And there were some um, differences in the monoterpene profile. However, the largest difference um, was in our stress sesquiterpene category. And so this was a statistically significant in comparison to that measured for our healthy set. And this stress category um, included farnesine and germaclean, which are well-known um, plant stress hormones. And so besides the chemical signature, we also saw physical evidence of um, ethan stress. So if you, you can't really see here, but there's a bunch of white specks on the tree and I didn't know what it was. So I shook it onto a Petri dish. We actually identified, um, thanks to the help of Kaylin Mooney, um, a professor here, um, that these are aphid exoskeletons. So aphids shed their skin over the course of their life, but we also saw some live aphids. So this is Frank. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here I'm showing the relative humidity dependent viscosity for um, our stress and healthy plant SOA um, identified in the filled in colors. And our mimic SOA that I talked about in the first section of this fence um, with mimic outlined in black and uh, mimic healthy outlined in black and mimic stress outlined in red. And we can see that um, for both of our systems compared to our mixed or um, proxy mixtures, that they overlap quite nicely. And if you extrapolate that to mixing times as well, they can accurately um, predict mixing time. And so we found that real tree SOA viscosity can be represented by mimic SOA that comes from um, um, mixtures of monitor and stress. So additionally, we looked at the particle phase um, composition for stress outlined in pink and healthy uh, outlined in black. And we saw that as a function of uh, mass to charge or the fragments of different ions and uh, some of normalized intensities between our different trials, we saw that there is an increase in, um, in intensity for our stress plant SOA above 110 um, mass to charge. And um, we were thinking that this was due to um, stress plant emissions like sesquiterpenes, um, but because they're fragments, it's hard to identify. So I found a paper that used uh, the terpelium ion as an indicator for um, stress plants. So they found that if there is an increased fraction of this mass fragment 91 in a stress system compared to a healthy system, this was attributed to sesquiterpene products. And so this is indication that um, the difference between these two systems is from our stress compound. To make this more meaningful, we bend our individual fragments. And so this is just considering organic fragments. And we found that for our stress system, there is an increased fraction of, um, of carbons that had a, 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 um, fragments with greater than 10 carbon. And so to get greater than 10 carbon, you need to have a sesquiterpene around. Monoterpenes are a C10 compound. And so the presence of these higher carbon numbers indicate uh, stress compounds. So the increased abundance of these uh, C10 compounds for stress theory island pine compared to the healthy indicates increased um, sesquiterpene. And so in conclusion, although um, about 80% of the VOCs that are emitted from healthy canary island pines were attributed to alpha pinene, the resulting photooxidation is rather viscous, and this confirms the results from our first study um, looking at mixtures. Also, aphid stress canary island pine trees have a somewhat uh, different terpene profile, and previous reports have shown that even subtle differences of about 5 to 10 percent, which were within the same regime as us, about 20 percent, um, they can have big effects on SOA yield and oxidation product distribution. And so they also can have a big impact on physical properties, such as phase separation and viscosity. And we found that real stress canary island pine SOA had similar viscosity to the stress plant SOA as reported in our mixtures. We also found that SOA produced from real trees have mixing times greater than an hour for room temperature conditions and less than 40% humidity, which has previously been reported based off of um, previous studies, but it has not been confirmed until now. So 
as an extension of this study, um, I was a part of a different paper um, by Fabian Martin, which he investigated binary mixture systems of both monoterpene and saxoterpene SOA, as well as um, anthropogenic and biogenic systems. And he also included our stress canary island pine um, from our last study, so our real pine tree yesterday. And he investigated phase separation. And what he found was that we had phase separation occurring across all humidities investigated. So 100 to 0% relative humidity. Um, so this was um, you know, even more than the diesel system and it was somewhat comparable to our mixture system. And so uh, phase separation could be occurring a lot more often than we think in the atmosphere. Uh, further extension of my work, um, we investigated the global distribution in phase state of um, in mixing times within SOA in the troposphere based off of room temperature, viscosity, and um, measurements. So this was for our simulated healthy pine tree SOA, so our healthy mimic. And they found um, here is a plot of altitude versus latitude, and they were looking to see where uh, particles can be found to be black sea in the atmosphere. And so um, they assumed different um, temperatures and humidities based off of where they were um, latitudinally and altitudinally. And here they're reporting PG versus T, um, which essentially tells you if it's greater than one, it indicates glassy aerosol. So this is the glass transition temperature versus ambient temperature. So above this red line here, um, particles are expected to be glassy. And so they found that the glassy state can often occur um, and the mixing times of water can often exceed one hour at altitudes greater than six kilometers. They also found that mixing times of organic molecules within SOA can often exceed one hour throughout most of the uh, free troposphere, so greater than about one kilometer in altitude. And they found that um, within the planetary boundary layer, so within the first kilometer, um, that the glassy state is not important and the mixing times of water and organic molecules are less than one hour. However, this does not hold true um, wherever you are. So at the South Pole, um, this line dips very low and it's because um, of the really, really cold temperatures in Antarctica. And so particles can actually be glassy, like really close to the surface. Also, this paper doesn't account for any um, movement throughout the atmosphere, so it's not accounting for a particle being transported from low altitude to high altitude. So more experiments are going to be needed in order to figure that out. Also, this was only looking at our healthy plant system, and as I showed, uh, stress plant SOA had increased viscosity. So um, I predict that um, the glassy phase is going to be a lot lower for the um, stress plant SOA. So um, that was sort of outlining two of the major studies that I've done, but I've been a part of many other studies um, investigating first single VOC systems. So I investigated beta caryophylline ozonolysis SOA um, as a function of relative humidity dependent viscosity. And we found that um, this should be well mixed within the lower atmosphere. So a single sesquiterpene system should be well mixed. Uh, we also investigated farnesine SOA, which was our uh, primary sesquiterpene SOA. And um, this is currently an open discussion. And we also investigated valencine SOA, which is a cyclic sesquiterpene. Um, moving on to our mixture study. Um, I talked about this earlier, but we investigated diesel fuel vapor SOA, which is a good proxy for anthropogenic emissions. And we found that the, the viscosity was somewhat similar to polyamine, um, although the mixing times of organics was about 50 hours at low relative humidity. And this was the first time that we saw phase separation down to 70%, um, which had not been seen before. And then I talked a lot about my healthy mimic SOA and my um, real mimic, or my real SOA from Carry Island Pines. And we found that alpapine had the lowest viscosity, followed by healthy plant SOA and stress plant SOA, and that the physical properties of SOA from trees cannot be modeled by parameters currently developed um, by a single component VOC system, um, which is commonly used in a lot of lab studies. But we did find, based off of our real trees, that um, real pine SOA can be represented by multi component mixtures. And so um, it's recommended that future studies account for monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes with both acyclic and cyclic structures to more accurately represent the physical properties of aerosol. And then we also had some broader implication studies. So I talked about the global distribution already. Um, but as a tangent, we also investigated uh, a different process that could be impacted by um, 
the SCOPTI, which is reactive uptake of gases. And so for this, we investigated the relative humidity um, impact on the reactive uptake of ammonia and dimethylamine by um, nitrogen-containing aerosol. And what we found was that the reactive uptake coefficients decreased with increasing relative humidity or lower viscosity. And this is because nitrogen-containing organic compounds formed by a condensation reaction between ammonia um, with, with SOA, which produces water as a product. So um, identifying how um, viscous our SOA is could also impact things like gas uh, uptake. And so the key takeaways of my um, dissertation and my work here is that complex systems of uh, mixtures of biogenic SOA are needed in lab studies in order to accurately represent physical properties of aerosol. And in a changing environment, when plant stress due to aphid herbivory is expected to increase, there will be higher emission rates of phosphoterpenes, which will lead to chemically and physically different SOA than we currently see for healthy or single monitor bean SOA. And more studies investigating the physical properties of SOA are recommended to accurately assess their impact on climate and health. Um, so with that, I would like to thank everybody that helped me along the way. So I would like to thank my committee members, Sergey, uh, for being my PI and being so supportive over the years. Um, Celia, I would like to thank you for taking me in as one of your own and um, always being there to help answer questions. And um, Manabu, thank you for being the chair of my committee for advancement and also being a wonderful professor to work with for um, environmental chemistry. And then also, I did not do any of my experiments without my wonderful collaborators. Um, so I would like to thank all of Alan Bertram's lab at University of British Columbia. Jesse, I know you're online. Thank you for all of the viscosity work that you've done. Um, also, uh, the Shrival lab, I haven't shown any of his work today, but in my dissertation, I did um, discuss implications for how we can predict viscosity. And so, um, Lindsay and Ling, uh, and Ying um, did a lot of work to help me with this. And then also, Alex Lapkin, um, Donald Dabda, Shu Zhu, and then everybody else in Air UCI, all my friends here, um, thank you so much for supporting me. Um, I would also like to show some pictures. So this is all of the Air UCI cohort, um, also my uh, SARP family, and then um, here's the Air UCI retreat, all of, our, um, all of our collaborators. Oh, and this is me and my plant. Had to wear sunglasses because um, we had lamps. <laughs> and then I would also like to thank all my friends that helped me stay sane throughout graduate school. So thank you so much. And also thank you everyone that's online. Thank you for coming. So with that, I'd like to take any questions.